once again, we have hit a bit of a lull in the pop music world. The song of the summer is, is what, fancy, I guess? That's pretty pathetic. You don't need to hear fancy. If you went the rest of your life not hearing fancy, you wouldn't miss anything. Yeah, pretty much no one has any buzz right now. If you want to know how bad it is, the most buzzed about album of the year so far is full of these big, mega popular singles from 40 years ago. Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where normally we cover songs that are no longer relevant. But since Guardians of the Galaxy's Awesome Mix Volume 1 is album of the year, basically, I think we should cover its signature tune, the one that was in all the trailers, that classic of 70s pop, that one that goes ooga chaka, ooga chaka for no good reason, hooked on a feeling by Blue Suede. And because we're reviewing Blue Suede, I thought I'd bring back a friend of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, that dude in the suede. I'm, I'm flattered, but I'm pretty sure that's Swede, Todd. Huh? The name of the band, Blue Swede. I think they were Swedish, actually. Oh. Okay, well, that, that's fine. We can still do this. I mean, you're Swedish, right? O okay, I know that you know that I'm from New... I'm setting this one out. Oh. Okay. That's a shame, because I could really use some help on this one, because Blue Swede's Hooked on a Feeling is just a weird goddamn song. I like putting novelties like this in context, but the more I found out about this band, the less sense it made. I don't know if it even made sense at the time, and the song's long and strange lifespan as a cultural artifact has just made it even weirder. I can't think of anything else that's been associated with a talking raccoon, David Hasselhoff, and a neurotic lawyer's fear of her own biological clock as represented by an animated gif of a terrifying dead-eyed baby. How did all this happen? Why does it go Uga Chaka? What does it have to do with the baby? I don't get it! What does it mean? What does it mean? There's a message in here somewhere. What are you trying to tell me? I wish I could tell you I found the answer, but uh, this case remains unsolved. So I'm, I'm just going to gather everything I found and present it, because I sure can't figure this song out. Can you? Okay, Blue Suede has its origin. Blue Swede. Blue. S I'm going to get that wrong every time. Okay, Blue Swede has its origins in its lead singer, Bjorn Skiffs, which is not a fake Swedish name I made up on my own. And he started in the early 60s with an RB group called the Slam Creepers, which is not a name I could ever make up on my own because that is just too awesome for words. Slam Creepers. As I understand, they were somewhat successful in Europe, and listening to them, I'd say they're surprisingly credible as a soul band. But they broke up in the late 60s, and after that, Bjorn started a new band, Blue Swede. They released their first single, Silly Millie, and couldn't find footage of it, so I'm just gonna improvise here. Sitting in a bus stop, singing silly songs. Silly Millie, you really kill me. Now why don't you feel me? My love is too strong. But, but yeah, this didn't do very well. You will note that their accents are a lot thicker here than on their big hit, maybe that's why. Or maybe it's because it's a complete ripoff of the sweets Little Willie from the year before. Allegedly, Blue Swede were trying to model themselves on the early 70s British glam rock bands like The Swede and Slade, but uh, those were actual rock bands, and this is more on the doofy Tony Orlando side of 70s music. And can I just say, the fact that they sound like this kind of throws me off. How can I explain? Like, even with the thick accents, they don't sound very Swedish. Like, I always imagine Swedish music to sound like this, or this, or this. But these guys sound like just another, you know, Three Dog Night or somebody. They could sing We're an American Band and I wouldn't bat an eye. Which I suppose is one reason they got big in America. I wish I could tell you more, but any other reasons is... You know, when I was a little kid, I had this like little toy tape player. I used to listen to my parents' old cassettes on it, one of which had hooked on a feeling on it. So you know, it's just like the movie. God, memories! I remember turning it on and just hearing that unforgettable intro. Of an electric sitar, and not a bunch of idiots chanting "Uga Chaka," because the version I know is the original by B.J. Thomas from 1968. 
And you know, I don't, I don't even think I, I realize it, but I really love this song. Now, Hooked on a Feeling is a pretty simple tune based around a pretty simple idea. Being loved feels good. It's not groundbreaking, I guess, and B.J. Thomas always sounded like a complete dork with a bad head cold, but he sells it. So, why did Blue Swede decide to take this modest little song and put Uga Chaka all over it? Well, they didn't. Not only is this not the first version of Hooked on a Feeling, it's not even the first Uga Chaka version of Hooked on a Feeling. That comes from British songwriter Jonathan King in 1971. Now, I'd never heard of this guy, but he apparently had a fascinatingly diverse and successful career as a talent scout, record producer, and television personality. And like so many beloved British entertainers from the 70s, he turned out to be a pedophile. Brits, how the hell does that keep happening? Anyway, King was inspired to add Uga Chaka to Hooked on a Feeling after hearing a similarly goofy 50s novelty song of questionable racial sensitivity called Running Bear. I wish I could tell you about how Hoya 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 became Uga Chaka, Uga Chaka, but that's literally all I know. I assume there's something racist about it, even though I couldn't tell you how or against who. That's the really baffling thing about it, how little connection it has to anything in or out of the song. It's just there, without explanation. So if even Uga Chaka is an original, what does Blue Suede at Swede? What does Blue Swede add to Hooked on a Feeling? Honestly, not much. The biggest difference is Jonathan King was kind of the scrawny nerd, but Blue Swede are very forceful and loud and hard to miss. Like even if Uga Chaka was just this normal thing no one cared about, you'd still notice Blue Swede instantly. And I don't consider that a great thing. Bjorn Skiffs, at least on this song, is just this bellowing ox of a singer who's got this almost Chad Krogery thing going on. Okay, not that bad, but... You know, he's still got this like burly, barreling baritone that I don't like at all. But if you ask me, the biggest difference between this and the original isn't Uga Chaka or the horns or the different singer. It's the way it goes. Aah. And the original, B.J. Thomas just holds that line to one note and he just belts it. Cause he's happy. He's in love. It's the best moment in the song. That one. Minor change in the melody completely robs the song of any power for me. Matter of fact, nowhere does this sound like a love song. Bjorn just lumbers his way through the song like he doesn't understand the lyrics, which, I don't know, maybe he doesn't. It's not even trying to be a love song, I don't think. It's, it's just trying to be kitschy and weird. Which, I guess, is why this is the most remembered version of the song. You never forget it once you've heard it. And, to be fair, that is certainly an achievement. Whatever the reason for this interpretation of Hooked on a Feeling, it has endured. But quite frankly, I hate it. I, I didn't even realize I hated it because I always turn it off instantly, because who wants to listen to that? Uh, having listened to it several times now, this version is terrible. I'm not at all surprised they didn't have a second hit. Except they did. Their next single was also a cover, as was all their subsequent singles, and more than half of their two albums, including a cover of Cher's Half-Breed, which is pretty damn funny. In the case of their follow-up, the song was Never My Love by The Association. Now, the Association had been kind of written out of rock history, but this song has held up really well. It's just got this sleek, earnest, dreamlike vibe, and if it hasn't been in a Wes Anderson movie yet, I'll be real surprised. This is what Blue Swede did with it. Well, congratulations guys, you stomped the crap out of another classic 60s pop song. Way to go. And get this, this was a top 10 hit. I wish I had known that before I started writing this episode. 
because I, I do try to avoid things like this. You know, some acts that get labeled one-hit wonders, even though they had plenty of successful songs because they only had one that people really remember, I don't think that counts. I get a lot of requests for Rick Astley for this show and it will never happen. Never. I hope that's clear. So uh, maybe I, I screwed up by including Blue Swede for this show, but you know, you know I'm, I'm gonna give you guys a ruling here. Yes, they are in fact a one-hit wonder. No one remembers this song, it's on almost none of those 70s compilations, and I don't care if it plays in the top 10. So did Gentlemen by Psy, that was not a hit, and neither is this, the end. They only ever released one more album and had only one more minor charting single, a mashup of It's Alive by Tommy James and Hush by Deep Purple. Hush, of course, is an all-time great hard rock song, so I'm not looking forward to see how they ruined that. Is, uh, is this the intro to some kind of funky 70s cop show? Honestly, this is kind of awesome. Blue Swede broke up after Bjorn decided to go solo. Unfortunately, most of the information I could find about him was written in complete gibberish with weird marks over the vowels. But from what I can tell, Bjorn has continued to be a big deal in Sweden land. Like, I can't remember if I've mentioned Eurovision before, but in case you don't know, it's this super cheesy European song contest that brought ABBA to the world. Well, just like ABBA, Bjorn represented Sweden at Eurovision too. Twice. From what I can tell, at this point, his stuff became a lot more recognizably Swedish. Not just in Swedish, but, you know, Swedish sounding. And it's not only Eurovision that connects him to ABBA either. Like, you know the guys from ABBA wrote a musical, right? You know, chess. One night in Bangkok and the tough get going. Yeah, that's from that musical. Well, Bjorn has a song from it too. I'm not much of a Broadway guy, but I, I do hope I get to see Chess someday, just so I can find out what the hell is going on, because it looks insane. And even many decades after his biggest success, he still seems to be a major star over there. He was still having Swedish hits into the new millennium. And he even performed a couple years ago at the Royal Wedding. The Swedish Royal God, thank you. So yeah, all of that in a career, all because of Uga Chaka. Uh, Sweden, you seem to like the guy. You could have kept all this for yourself, honestly. Look, 70s AM bubble rock was made by a bunch of these short-lived, manufactured bands that no one took seriously as artists, not even themselves. So trying to analyze them as, you know, artists is difficult. But I've listened to enough Blue Sweet now that I think I've got a handle on who they were and I would call them a very poor man's blood, sweat, and tears. Blue Swede, I am confident in saying, did not need to exist. But you know, if you have a bottomless tolerance for 70s kitsch, then yeah, go ahead, Uga Chuck all you want. Me? No, I'll pass. Sorry, Star-Lord. Awesome Mix Volume 1 is a little less awesome than you think it is. <laughs>